being able to do what you want when you want. So when you go to your job, when I went to my job, 30 years in the corporate world, you had those set hours. They wanted you there all the time. But the last job I had, microelectronic circuit engineer at Motorola Semiconductor, seven to five, Monday through Friday, sometimes weekends. They want you there. They want you at the desk. You gotta be there. You gotta ask permission to go be with your kids, do the thing you want to. Becoming an entrepreneur. Now it is challenging, obviously, to begin with. But your ultimate goal is your why. Why are you doing it? Begin with. Most of what I hear from my entrepreneurs is that time, the freedom to go out there and do what you want. Not only do they define wealth in a couple different ways. One is money, the other one is freedom, the time freedom. Yeah. Do what you want. So that's what your goal is, is to eventually, and that's what my book is all about, the real freedom part, is about having the freedom to do what you want when you want. This is the Entrepreneurs United Podcast with your hosts, John St. Pierre and Rich Hoffman. Hey, entrepreneurs. Today, we're sitting down with Greg Moore. He's the CEO of Franchise Maven and also the author of the uh, Wall Street Journal's bestseller, Real Freedom. Greg, thanks for joining us here today. John, it's a pleasure. I appreciate you having me, sir. I, I, I first want to dive right into your book. So you wrote a book called Real Freedom. Can you talk to me a little bit about what the genesis was on writing the book Real Freedom to begin with and really what the content is of that book? Why entrepreneurs should grab a handle of it? Well, John, I've been doing this for probably about 12 years now. And the first couple of years was mostly my own franchise that I was running. And then I did the franchise consulting on the side. And then I just got real busy with the franchise consulting. So I just sold off my franchise and just did the consulting part. And what I get after 12 years of doing all this, I get a lot of the same questions over and over again about franchising. So what I thought is that why not put together a book about all the different questions that my people ask me on a regular basis. So I put them all down in a book, step-by-step -step process of how you go through to investigate a franchise, real world examples of people who I've worked with, who've done it. And just, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, you can just go out there and grab that book and it's just right there, step-by-step, -step, what to look for, how to investigate the franchises, funding, all sorts of different things in there. Just as good information for people to have, good education for people to have. Okay. So why you've been in this industry for quite a while. You've seen uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, maybe I would suspect, move from a J-O-B to freedom. If somebody's listening to this job and, and they were thinking, maybe one day I'll own my own business, but they haven't really started their own. I've really taken that journey. What would be the sales pitch to be like, here's why you should consider running your own business? Being able to do what you want when you want. So when you go to your job, when I went to my job, 30 years in the corporate world, you had those set hours. They wanted you there all the time. But the last job I had, microelectronic circuit engineer at Motorola Semiconductor, seven to five, Monday through Friday, sometimes weekends. They want you there. They want you at the desk. You got to be there. You got to ask permission to go be with your kids, do the thing you want to. Becoming an entrepreneur. Now, it is challenging, obviously, to begin with. But your ultimate goal is your why. Why are you doing it to begin with? Most of what I hear from my entrepreneurs is that time, the freedom to go out there and do what you want. Not only do they define wealth in a couple of different ways. One is money. The other one is freedom and time freedom. Yeah. Do what you want. So that's what your goal is, is to eventually, and that's what my book is all about. The real freedom part is about having the freedom to do what you want when you want. Greg, in all your experience with franchisors, what are some of the patterns that you notice in excellent franchisors, which may not be there in not so good of franchisors? Commitment to growing their franchisees when they get into the system. So I have my people take a look at a few different things when they're going through the franchise disclosure documents, especially find out where that franchise is making their money at. First of all, they should be making their money on their royalties that, that people are putting into the franchise system, because then you know that franchisor has a vested interest in making certain that you grow. So the more you grow, the more royalties you pay, the more they grow. There's some franchises out there that will make money off of the franchise fee itself. Not a good sign if you see that, because then they just have to sell more franchises. If you sell a product and they get kickbacks from the product manufacturer and they're making more money off the manufacturers of the kickbacks, that's generally not a good sign either. On that. So just from the money standpoint, you want to make certain that franchise is making the money, most of their money off the royalties. Also, what kind of services do they offer uh, to the franchisees? There's many different franchises that offer many different things on there. 
So if you're for the good franchises, I see them helping them out with the client acquisition. That's probably the one of the biggest things that you're going to be going for out there is you got to get your customers somehow or another. So what I see with the great franchises doing is going out there and working on client acquisition with their new franchisees, especially their new franchisees. And then the other part, of course, is having the employees to run it for them. So what you want to be looking for, there's a good franchise or that is going to help you and show you where to find those workers, whether they be real employees or 1099 contract workers, you want somebody that's going to go out there and show you how to do it uh, on that. And then mentoring, you want one with that has good mentors on there. You want to make certain that they're going to have meetings with you every week to get you going. Gets a little bit of a process to get started on that. So you really want a great franchise system to be there for you every step of the way as you grow your business. So you're never wondering, what do I do next? Regarding the risk for franchisors of joint employer with excellent franchisors, where do you find the line of joint employer where they're maybe doing too much that crosses that line versus they've maxed out what they're able to do without crossing that line of joint employer? What do you mean by joint employer? A joint employer being the staff that the franchise owner hires on believing that they may be staff of the franchisor versus the franchise owner. So where's the line that you have found in excellent franchisors that what are the activities that they're doing to contribute towards bringing on the correct staff without having there be a joint employer issue? A great process, a great step-by-step process to go through. This is the right questions to ask and the right places to look for your people. So the ones that I found, what they'll do is they'll say, these are the places that we've looked and we've done this many times in the past. We've reproduced it. These are the questions we ask each one of our individuals, potential employees that will weed out the ones that aren't so good and then filter in the ones that are good. So you got to have that on there because you as a new entrepreneur, whether you get into a franchise or whether you get in your own private business, but especially with the franchise, you don't necessarily know where to go look for people about that because you may not know the business. John and I were talking about earlier, some people may not know anything about, they get into certain core painting, they don't know anything about painting. So they don't necessarily know where to go find the best painters. So they're relying on the franchise or then to say outsource, this is where you go look for them at. These are the questions that you ask them. That way you know that the people you're getting are some of the best in the business. What would you say is an average royalty fee for the franchisors who you, I know you work on behalf of the entrepreneur for finding a franchise. And part of that is going to be advising them on what does the franchise do? What's the royalty structure? What type of support do they provide? Where there's actually inventory to be able to place somebody. I'm curious on the royalty side, what's the average royalty that you see? I usually between five and 10%. So right around six or seven. And I tell my people, and for those of you who are listening out there, if you're wondering, you know, what the difference is between five or 10%, look and see what that franchisor does for you. What kind of services they offer. Maybe they have a call center on that. So your royalty may be a little bit higher on something like that. Maybe they not only set appointments, but they'll do quotes over the phone. So then your royalties may be a little bit higher on that. So look what you get for it. But generally I see rich between five and 10%, probably right around Six, seven is about average. Okay. And what are the attributes of a franchise owner that you believe would make them successful as a franchise owner? What would be the top three to five attributes that uh, you would identify as, boy, if you have A, B, C, and D, you're going to be good in a franchise system. What are those? The top one and probably the most important one of all is you've got to be coachable. That's what you get into a franchise for is that they're going to show you exactly what it is that you need to uh, do uh, and you need to be able to follow that process as well on that. So be coachable, be able to follow a process and really just a a great positive attitude uh, towards whatever you're getting into on that. Each franchise is going to be a little bit different as far as what kind of experience you may need in there, Uh, but having a, a great attitude, being coachable. And having an entrepreneur mindset of wanting to be successful in your venture are, are the things that I really go over with my potential uh, uh, candidates. Yeah, Greg, we recently had a guest on our podcast, John Hewitt. He was the founder of Jackson Hewitt, 
the tax service had thousands of locations and went on to start Liberty Tax and had thousands of locations of those things. And we were talking about as a franchisor, because he was a franchisor who had franchised his system out. When you're working with franchisees, where's that push and pull, right? You want them to grow from the same token. They also want to run their own business and this idea of coachability, right? And if you think about a company, let's get out of franchising just for a second. When you hire people in your business that you want to grow and maybe take divisions of your company like an entrepreneur would a franchise, they also need to be coachable. But yet we're A-type personality entrepreneurs. So how can an entrepreneur who wants to control their own destiny and the franchisees say, or franchisors saying, hey, you have to do it this way. You have to do it this way. What would be the, the, the lesson there? Maybe some examples of franchises you saw that couldn't be coachable or you know, why it's important to stay the line. Keep rinse and repeat the way you're taught. That's why you bought a franchise system versus, ah, I'm going to do it differently here in my world. Well, uh, that's one of the things that I'll go over, John, with my folks on that, uh, especially my newer entrepreneurs or my younger entrepreneurs that haven't done it before on that is, is the fact that you're getting into a franchise because they have that system in place. But a lot of the franchises, although, as you say, you must do it this way, there's a lot of franchises out there that will give you a lot of room for creativity. I had a lady that was up in the Las Vegas Valley. She worked in, she was a vice president in the gaming industry in hotels and motels. And she took over the, the Las Vegas Valley for a tutoring franchise. And she said, you folks have never uh, hit up the hotels and motels to drum up some business in there. And they're like, no, it's not in our business model. This is you know not a proven method that we've done so far. But if that's what you want to do, go for it. She went for it. Uh, it didn't work on that. So she got off to a bit of a slow start on that one on there. She eventually came back around and realized, okay, this isn't working. Let's go back to the basic business model of what you had planned out for me, do it that way. And then she became very successful after that. Okay. When you're a successful franchise, E, you're running your business, you got it off the ground. You're now making the income that the franchisor said you could probably make by running this franchise. You get comfortable. It's okay. Now I have this lifestyle business. I'm making some really good income, but I want more. I got my business here and maybe my business can only grow a certain amount more in my territory, in my region or whatever. What would you say to those entrepreneurs in terms of pushing the limits of growth of the franchise or expanding to new territories within that franchise or master franchises where you, hey, I have more regions. Like some franchises make a lot of money. Some franchises make a little bit less money. You need multiple of them in order to really make a good earning. Or if you think about Shaquille O'Neal, who owns probably 20 franchises of 10 different systems, what would you say to that real aggressive entrepreneur who really wants to keep building business assets they go into one franchise, they get the lifestyle business. What would you recommend that person do as the next step to keep growing entrepreneurially? Yep. So they want to grow their business. They want to expand out. Uh, what do I suggest they do? A couple different avenues to go with that one, John. And I have had people, quite a few people, not quite a few, but a few people do it as well. A couple different things that you can do is if, you, if you want to grow your business, there's a horizontal growth and then there's vertical growth on that. And then there's just diversification within the franchise system itself. I had one gentleman who bought a number of the hair salons, the corporate hair salons that I had for resales there for a while. He wanted to grow his system. So we put together a plan for him whereby every 10 salons or so that he would purchase, he'd hire or seven, about seven, I think it was about every seven that he purchased that he would put in an area manager for it so that he limited the number of people that he actually had to work with on that one. So we got him up to, I think we got him up before we were all said and done to about a hundred different, the hair salon locations on that. And then at every seven that he'd put in on the individuals, he would have a, a regional manager and then he would group them again in groups of seven for the regional manager so that they have a district manager on top of that. So it's really, when you want to grow, you want to have an infrastructure in place so that you're not having to deal with a hundred different franchisees on that. You want that infrastructure and management structure in place so that you're dealing with individual people. Now, if you're not quite that aggressive and don't want hundred locations, uh, you just want a few more within the, each one of the industries. So if you're looking at a home services industry, for example, it, it's a really good example to look into in that if you just want to keep within your one territory and you don't want to expand out, then you want to do the vertical growth. In which case, what we want to look at for you then is what other services can you offer the homeowners that you're already working with? So if you're already doing the painting and you see in there and they say they want something painted, but you go in there and say, this is your porch 
you know, I can paint your porch for you. The things falling apart, molding, cracking all over the place. You need to get that replaced before we can paint it for you. So now if you had the handyman services franchise, which you could pick up, you could just send your own handyman in there and do that. And then while you're there, you may look inside the house and say, hey, if you want somebody, one of my people to come out here and do a, a free home cleaning for you to see what that's all about, I can offer you home clean now. So that's a good way to do vertical expansion on that. And then if you're really just like that one franchise system itself and you just want to grow out, then you just want to expand out on that one and just pick up more territories on that. But just keeping in mind what your role is going to be and how that might change as you pick up more territories and who you might need to help you with that growth whether you need to get another manager in there for each individual territory or whether your people can handle that at that point in time, but always plan for that in the future. Yeah, it's interesting. I have a core belief that at this stage of my career, and many people may feel the same way, the idea of a startup is pretty daunting. Like startups take five, seven, 10 years to really get going. The idea of doing that to me is like, oh my gosh, that's not something I really wanna engage in. I'm either gonna go buy a business or do something, but an alternative is to speak with somebody like you and say, hey, uh, I don't just want one franchise. Let's go find something where I can actually go build a conglomerate of franchises. What's that system going to look like as we get this one going? How do we bring people in place? And kind of really start with the end in mind, if you will, versus the end being, I'm just going to go buy this one franchise location and figure it out later. You can almost start in talking with a consultant like you, something like that. And Rich, when I think about that, and you think about somebody like Shaquille O'Neal or other entrepreneurs who are like, hey, I want to invest. I want to invest in things. I really like the idea, too, of investing in a franchise and putting in management, entrepreneurs, having them be a part owner of it, helping them grow. I had this idea of a shark tank, of grabbing like really good young entrepreneurial people who don't have the money to start a franchise and partnering with them, buy a franchise, put them in place and mentor and lead them and then go do more of them. It seems to me like that would be pretty interesting, Rich. I'd imagine most franchisors have something in place in their franchise agreement saying, there has to be someone dedicated to that franchise location. It may or may not be, depending on the franchise agreement, the person who's signing on the dotted line, but the person who's signing on the dotted line is saying, I or someone I assign will be absolutely 100% dedicated to grow that business, which is how somebody like Shaquille O'Neal can have, whatever he has, eight or 10 different franchises. He's not actually running them all. He's putting the people in place who are actually running them. Yeah. I'm curious, when we think about the cash and leverage side of buying a franchise, Greg, what's your recommendation? For example, is it getting an SBA is fine, is good? Or would you say, actually, if you have to borrow money, that's not optimal? Would you say leveraging your uh, 401? If you need to do that, go ahead and do that. Or would you say you have to have cash? Can you rough out what is optimal and what is the unhealthy end of, you know what, you're going to be overstretched buying this franchise and you're actually not even going to be able to fund the growth if you do it that way. A couple of different questions you got in there, Rich. That yeah, one. sorry about that. Well, all right. Is there any or all okay. that came to mind for you? First of all, I generally don't make recommendations. I educate people on the different good and bad points of each type of obtaining money on that one. So first off, use your money, use other people's money. I tell my folks, most of my investors, they love using other people's money as long as the investment services the debt. You can do that. SBA is a great way to go on that one. Home equity line of credit on that one you can go. So if you don't want to use your money, if you want to use other people's money, go with a loan. If you don't like going into debt and you don't want to go into debt, then the 401k plan is a good way to go. But that is a very personal decision on your part because that is your retirement money. And I can pretty much guarantee your CPA is probably not going to have anything positive to say about it because most CPAs either don't know anything about it or really don't want you to use your retirement money. So that is a personal decision. I did the 401k rollover to run my business. I believed in myself and believe that I could do it. And then I believed in the franchise that I got involved in as well, knowing that I would get my money back, which I did. So you can use that. Basically, you use money that's either in a 401k or IRA, or 401k from a previous employer or IRA. You roll that into a self-directed fund. You run a C corporation that way. Good points, bad points about those. On that, I've got experts on that you can talk to. So that is definitely a personal decision. I educate them. I have them 
I introduced them to uh, a couple of different lenders out there that we have that do specifically for franchises so they can get all their information. We talk through it and see what's best for them as far as running out of money, Rich, and as far as being not having enough money to get into it. That's something we take a look at even before I start introducing franchises to them. So there is what you qualify for as far as the franchise says you need a $200,000 net worth to run this business and you've got to have a $200,000 net worth. So I say, we're going to take a look at the ones that you qualify for financially, but I've really got to know is what are you comfortable investing in that franchise to begin with? So I don't bring them any franchises or recommend any franchises where they'd be even close to running out of money. Because I tell them, nobody wants you to run out of money. Franchiser doesn't want you to run out of money. It looks bad for them. If you go out of business, obviously it's bad for you. It's bad for me too, because then and I get into trouble with that. But I don't come close. I make certain that with the funds that they have, and as we're going through the process, I make certain that they fill out a pro forma. So for your entrepreneurs out there that are doing a pro forma, what you want to do is you want to put on that spreadsheet all the costs that are involved. You want to find out, and it's easier to do probably in franchising than it is in the private world, but find out where that money's coming in at and how many clients you need to get to that break-even level, how long it's going to take you to get there, how much money do you have set aside that you can do that with, because you got to be comfortable with not making a whole lot of money to begin with. As John pointed out, it, it takes a little while to, to get these things built up. So you got to make certain that you have that in that spreadsheet and have that filled out so that you know how much money you have, when it's going out at that certain date, when you're going to hit break even, and where your funds are going to be at the whole time. Um, past engineer in my life, so that's what I did. So I like spreadsheets. So some people, if you're not real good at spreadsheets out there, get used to it if you're going to get into a business and get familiar with how to fill those out. Here's what I'm hearing. Certainly don't fudge the numbers so that you can qualify financially for it. And then also don't overstress yourself. Find a franchisor whose minimum requirement doesn't overstress you. And you've got to know that break-even point and have enough money to last even through that break-even point. Because a break-even point is going to be an average. Some people are going to be over the average on the break-even point. And you're going to want to make sure you have enough money to be able to withstand that without excessive stress. Got that. Thank you for that. Last question I've got for you. What are one or two little known secrets about franchising that really usually only someone of your experience would know? And I'm not necessarily looking for dirt unless that's something you want to provide, but what's something that's a little known secret that unless you've been around franchising for a decade plus, and I know you're over two decades, but unless you've been around franchise for a decade plus, you wouldn't know. That's interesting, Rich. One of the things that uh, a lot of my people, surprisingly enough, don't know is that the services industry and how many different franchises are in the services industry. Uh, you know, you and I, we drive around. We see McDonald's, Taco Bell, Super Cups, Great Clips, Mighty Key Mako. We see the brick and mortar. But my real estate, I was on a real estate show the other day, and I, I got so many people that called me and said, what's the service industry all about on there? They didn't realize that there's basically a franchise in every single industry uh, out there that you can do. And you don't have to be a millionaire to get into it. And you don't necessarily have to run them full time. There's some semi-absentee ones you can get into. Now, that's a whole other subject going into semi-absentee and how that works. But that's that's something that not, not everybody knows. The other thing that, that people don't always know, and it's one of the things I point out in my seven mistakes paper, is that the franchisees are going to be your friends. The franchisees you talk to along the way to validate and verify everything that franchisor told you, or your friends are going to help you grow that business. You're not competing with them for the most part. Most franchises, probably 90% of franchises, you're not competing with them. Everybody gives, gets a protected territory. So they don't realize is that not only are you out there with talking with those franchisees and validating that information, but those are also people and friends that you're going to make that are going to help you grow your business on there. And they don't realize that they get to talk to them. And I tell them that you must talk to them. Greg, if people want to get a hold of you to learn more about multiple franchise systems and if it would be a fit for them, how would you like them to do that? Simply go to my website, franchisemaven.com. That's franchise, M-A-V as in Victor, E-N.com. Email me at greg at franchisemaven.com or just pick up the phone and give me a call at 361 Seven six four zero one. I got to say, as a podcast co-host, I appreciate you being on. 
And as an employee of a franchisor, I sure appreciate what you do for systems like ours, where you're really matching the correct franchisor with the right entrepreneur to help ensure success happens. Thank you for you and your work and being on today. I appreciate you having me. It's been an honor, Rich. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Stay tuned as John and Rich unpack today's conversation. John, among other things that we heard today, I think if someone's considering a franchise, one of the things they want to absolutely take note of is to know where that break-even point is likely to come and make sure they're not cash strapped. If somebody's going to have to get a loan, it's probably the same for any business. Like I understand franchising presumably more than you, and you understand entrepreneurs in opening businesses which are not franchises presumably more than I. And I imagine it's not much different where you really got to understand your break even point and have that projection out there and get a loan one time where you're not having to endure stress financially because that's not going to help run the business and get to the break even point any faster. So while that's not unique to franchising, I don't think, and I'd love to have you weigh in, it's something that should absolutely be noted when looking at opening any business. Absolutely. We can align on this, Rich. Cash is king and queen, and you need cash to grow a business. And we can probably also align on this. Show me a projection, and I'll show you something that's missed 50% of the time. Because if you have 100% <laughs> of people putting projections together, they don't always hit. Now, sometimes they do. I love nothing more than to putting an annual budget or a projection for a startup business together and hitting it. But you show me a projection, I'm going to show you something that is most likely to be missed for one reason or another. It could be a COVID crisis. It could be because of this, because you didn't get the sale you thought you were going to get. It could be the employee who left you. I don't know why, but you have to be prepared for the unexpected. So show me a projection. If you plan on that projection on your cash break-even point, and you have nothing left in the coffers to fuel the unexpected, you're in trouble. So not only do you need to be prepared for your projection to miss from a cash perspective, because it could, you need to be prepared that what if your projection does hit and your business is growing and you want to fuel it with more cash to grow further, to get to the destination faster, that also takes cash. So you have to build your own capital for growth. And especially if you're going into a franchise, you need to know the math. That's the one thing that Greg said, which is, look, I used to be an engineer, so I'm good with spreadsheets. But I know way too many business people, not franchises or entrepreneurs, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what kind of business you're running that don't know their numbers cold and don't pre-plan the unexpected from a cash perspective along the way. Again, juxtaposing opening a business with opening a franchise business, the two things when I asked, what do you need in order to be successful? The first one was coachable and follow the process. So that's unique to a franchise system. If you're on your own and you're opening a business, I guess you could be coachable to a coach. If you have a mentor or somebody who's already done the business, sure, be coachable with them. But there's not a lot of coachability and following the process when you're doing it alone. So someone who is coachable and wants to follow a process and just has that preference, franchising's a good way to go or consider the second one that he brought up was having a positive mindset. Yeah, That's again, one of those things that's not unique to franchising. So having a positive mindset, assuming positive intent by the people who you have relationships with, nobody's out there trying to get you, trying to hurt you, trying to, uh, like, like they're typically less ulterior motives than one might originally think if we seek to understand why our vendors are doing a certain thing or why our employees are doing a certain thing. Having that positive mindset is so crucial as that business not just starts, but continues to grow and ultimately scale. Yeah. And it also applies to your business, a positive mindset within your team. Because if you think about it in the franchising world, like I know specifically franchises have this, hey, you're not in business by yourself, right? You're in business for yourself, but not by yourself kind of yes. mantra, right? Yes. And when you're an entrepreneur and a CEO of a business, sometimes you are by yourself and it's pretty darn lonely and you don't know where to go. You don't have this built in coach, this, these peers that you can rely on for guidance. Hey, what are you doing here? What are you doing there? You're by yourself. So that team that you build within your inner circle, that executive team, that leadership team, 
they need to be coachable. They need to have that positive mindset. You want to have to work, you want to work with them to achieve the goal and the destination. There's so many parallels that apply to whether you have a franchise business or a non-franchise business that, and they're so common that you need to relay one to the other, right? You, you can't have a leadership team with a negative mindset that aren't coachable and whatever. They, so they, they somewhat are somewhat parallel, but in the franchise business specifically, What's the point? If, you, if you're not going to jump into the culture of that franchise system and have a positive mindset and be coached and learn the systems, then what's the point? Might as well go through it the other way and do it the way you want to do it. If you Yeah, want why pay a royalty when you're not going to follow the system anyway, right?